Welcome to the next lecture in the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. This lecture will cover the Bitcoin network. We'll take a look at peer-to-peer -peer network architecture. We'll talk about node types and roles. We'll talk about the extended Bitcoin network, and we'll dive into some more additional details on full nodes and simplified payment verification, SPV nodes. So to begin with, let's talk about the peer-to-peer -peer network. You know, Bitcoin is structured as a peer-to-peer -peer network architecture on top of TCP IP, the internet. Uh, the term peer-to-peer -peer or P2P means that the computers that participate in the network are peers to each other. They're all equal. There are no special nodes like servers or clients, and that all nodes share the burden of providing network services. Uh, the network nodes interconnect in a mesh network with a flat topology. There's no server, there's no centralized service, and no hierarchy within the network. Nodes in a P2P network uh, both provide services and consume services at the same time, uh, with reciprocity acting as the incentive for participation. Um, so a node might be a client of another node, at the same time it might be a server to a different node. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks are inherently resilient, decentralized, and open. Uh, with nodes being able to come and go at will. Uh, a preeminent example of a P2P network architecture was the early internet itself, where nodes in the IP network uh, were equal. Today's internet architecture is more hierarchical, but the internet protocol still retains a flat topology essence. Uh, beyond Bitcoin, um, the largest and most successful application of P2P technologies is in the file sharing area with Napster and BitTorrent as examples of the architecture. Bitcoin's peer-to-peer -peer network architecture is more than a topology choice. Uh, Bitcoin is designed to be a P2P digital cash system, and the network architecture is both a reflection and a foundation of that core characteristic. Uh, decentralization of control is a core design principle that can only be achieved and maintained by a flat, decentralized, peer-to-peer -peer consensus network. The term Bitcoin network refers to the collection of nodes running the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer protocol. In addition to the Bitcoin P2P protocol, there are other protocols such as Stratum that are used for mining in lightweight or mobile wallets. These additional protocols are provided by gateway routing servers that access the Bitcoin network using the Bitcoin P2P protocol and then extend that, that, that network to nodes running other protocols. For example, Stratum servers connect Stratum mining nodes via the Stratum protocol to the main Bitcoin network and bridge the Stratum protocol to the Bitcoin P2P protocol. So the term extended Bitcoin network refers to the overall all network that includes the Bitcoin P2P protocol and other protocols like pool mining protocols, the Stratum protocol, and any other related protocols connecting the components of the Bitcoin system. So let's talk about node types and roles. Although nodes in the Bitcoin P2P network are equal, they can take on different roles depending on the functionality they're supporting. A Bitcoin node is a collection of functions, uh, routing, the blockchain database, uh, mining, and wallet services. All nodes include um, the routing function to participate in the network, and they might include the other functionality. Um, all nodes will be validating and propagating transactions and blocks and discover and maintain connections to peers. Here's an example of a node that has all four of those capabilities. It's got the network routing function, which we marked in orange. It's got its full uh, blockchain database function, which is in blue. It's got a wallet in green, and it's got a mining function in black. Um, so this might be, for an example, be the equivalent of Bitcoin Core with all of its capabilities deployed on a single node. So some nodes call full nodes also maintain a complete and up-to-date copy of the blockchain. Again, that's the blue that we just saw. Um, full nodes can autonomously and authoritatively verify any transaction without external reference. Some nodes maintain only a subset of the blockchain 
and verify transaction using a method called simplified payment verification or SPV for short. These nodes are known as SPV nodes or lightweight nodes. Um, in the full node example we saw here on this diagram, uh, the full node blockchain database function is, you know, what we saw in that uh, blue cir circle that had the letter B in it. If we were to look at a diagram showing the extended Bitcoin network with a variety of different node types in it, then SPV nodes would not have this blue circle because SPV nodes don't maintain a full copy of the blockchain. In fact, let's take a look at a diagram showing you that. Uh, here, for example, is a lightweight SPV wallet. It's got its routing capability. It's got the wallet, but it does not have a full blockchain node. Um, mining nodes will be competing to create new blocks by running specialized hardware to solve the proof of work algorithm. Some mining nodes are also full nodes, maintaining a full copy of the blockchain, while others are lightweight nodes, participating in pool mining and depend on a pool server to maintain a full node. The mining function will be shown in the, as a circle called minor, the letter M. So if we look up here, here's our minor function here. Wallets can be part of a full node, for example, uh, with a desktop Bitcoin client. However, increasingly many user wallets, especially those running on resource constrained devices, such as smartphones, are these SPV nodes we mentioned earlier. And the wallet function will be showed in our circle with a W here, this green little circle for wallet. So here's a look at some of these node types. Um, again, our reference client for Bitcoin Core has all four capabilities listed in here, the wallet, the miner, the full blockchain, and the routing node. Um, just a basic blockchain node that doesn't have wallet or mining capabilities would just be full blockchain and the network. Uh, our, our miner uh, that's not using a pool would just be a miner and network and a full blockchain. And our lightweight SPV wallet is just a wallet and the network routing node. Um, and let's dive into some of these uh, servers that are beyond this. Here, for example, we've got some pool protocol servers, a pool server and a stratum server. We've got mining nodes that are not full blockchain nodes. So they just have uh, the miner and their pro pool protocol uh, capability, whether they're using stratum or another. And here's a wallet that's using stratum. So the main Bitcoin network using uh, the Bitcoin P2P protocol has over 5,000 listening nodes running various versions of the Bitcoin reference client, Bitcoin Core, and or running other implementations of the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer protocol, such as Bitcoin Classic, Bitcoin Unlimited, Bitcoin J, Libitcoin, and so on. Uh, some A small percentage of the nodes in the Bitcoin P2P network are also mining nodes competing in the mining process validating transactions and creating new blocks. Various large companies interface with the Bitcoin network by running full node clients based on the Bitcoin core client with full copies of the blockchain and network node, both out mining or wallet functions. These nodes act as network edge routers, allowing other services like exchanges, wallets, merchant payment processing, and so on to be payment pay built on top of them. Uh, the extended Bitcoin network includes a network running the Bitcoin P2P protocol, as well as nodes running specialized protocols like mining pool protocols and so on. Um, and so attached to the main Bitcoin P2P network are gonna be pool servers and protocol gateways that connect nodes running those other protocols to the Bitcoin protocol. Uh, and again, this is mostly gonna be mining nodes or wallet clients, uh, which don't carry a full copy of the blockchain. So here is a diagram showing us our you know, extended uh, Bitcoin uh, network. So over here on the left-hand side, we've got some mining pools doing stratum mining. Then we've got some stratum client wallets. Uh, we also have some full node clients up here um, that aren't doing mining. 
Uh, down here, we have some edge routers who are just blockchain and network routing. Uh, we've got an SMSPV wallet, so just wallets and network routing. We've got some other mining pools that aren't stratum over here. Uh, we've got some solo miners that are doing full core implementation mining. They get the blockchain node and the network routing. You got some Bitcoin full Bitcoin core clients with wallet miner and network routing and the blockchain database and so on. Uh, so this kind of gives you an idea of all the different types of things the Bitcoin network can have in it. And obviously there's probably gonna be more types of architectures than just this, but these are the most common ones that you would find in the Bitcoin network. So let's talk about Bitcoin relay networks. While the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network serves the general needs of a broad variety of node types, it has too high network latency for the specialized needs of Bitcoin mining nodes. Bitcoin miners are engaged in a time-sensitive competition to solve the proof-of-work problem and extend the blockchain, uh, while, as discussed in our lecture on mining. While participating in this mining competition, Bitcoin miners must minimize the time between the propagation of a winning block and the beginning of the next round of competition. In mining, network latency directly impacts profit margins. A Bitcoin relay network is a network that attempts to minimize the latency in the transmission of blocks between miners. The original Bitcoin relay network was created in 2015 to enable fast synchronization of blocks between miners with very low latency. The network consisted of several specialized nodes hosted on uh, cloud infrastructure around the world and served to connect the majority of miners and mining pools. The original Bitcoin Relay Network was replaced in 2016 with the introduction of fast internet Bitcoin Relay Engine or Fiber. Uh, Fiber is a UDP-based relay network that relays blocks within a network of nodes. Fiber, Fiber implements compact block optimization to further reduce the amount of data transmitted and the network latency. Relay networks are not replacements for Bitcoin's peer-to-peer -peer network. Instead, they're overlay networks to provide additional connectivity between nodes with specialized needs. Just like freeways are not replacement for rural roads, but rather shortcuts between two points of heavy traffic, you still need small roads to connect to the freeways. So let's talk about network discovery. When a new node boots up, it must discover other Bitcoin nodes in the network in order to participate. To start this process, a new node must discover at least one existing node in the network and connect to it. The geographic location of other nodes is irrelevant. The Bitcoin network topology is not geographically defined. Therefore, any existing Bitcoin nodes can be selected at random. To connect to a node to a known peer, nodes establish a TCP connection usually the port 8333, uh, the port uh, generally known as the one used by Bitcoin or an alternative port if one's provided. Upon establishing a connection, the node will start a handshake by transmitting a version message, uh, which contains basic identifying information, including uh, this various information shown here, information like the version, the local services, the time, the IP address of the remote node, the IP address of the local node, and the type of software running on this node and the block height of this node's uh, blockchain. The version message is always the first message sent by any peer to another peer. The local peer receiving a version, version message will examine the remote peer's reported version and decide if the remote peer is compatible. If the remote peer is compatible, the local peer will acknowledge the version message and establish a connection by sending a message. Uh, acknowledging it. Um, so we can see here uh, on this diagram, the first message was the version, and then we got back our acknowledgement. So how does a new node find peers? The first method is to query DNS using a number of DNS seeds, which are DNS servers that provide a list of IP addresses of Bitcoin nodes. Some of those DNS seeds provide a static list of IP addresses of stable Bitcoin listening nodes. Some of the DNS seeds are custom implementations of the Berkeley internet name daemon bind that returns a random subset from a list of Bitcoin node addresses collected by a crawler or a long running Bitcoin node. 
The Bitcoin core client contains the names of nine different DNS seeds. The diversity of ownership and the diversity of implementation of the different DNS seeds offers a reliability for the initial bootstrapping process. In the Bitcoin core client, the option to use the DNS seeds is controlled by the op on an option switch. Alternatively, a bootstrapping node that knows nothing in the network must be given the IP address of at least one Bitcoin node after which it can establish connections through further introductions. Once one or more uh, connections are established, the new node will send an address message containing its own IP address to its neighbors. The neighbors will in turn forward the address message to their neighbors, ensuring that the newly connected node becomes well known and better connected. Additionally, the new, node, new connected node could send Git address to the neighbors, asking them to return a list of IP addresses of other peers. That way a node can find peers to connect to and advertise its existence on the network for other nodes to find it. So here we can see um, node A sending an address and uh, its address to node B. So node B knows about node A. Then it will send get address to node B and node B will then send some of the addresses it knows about to node A. A node must connect to a few different peers in order to establish diverse paths into the Bitcoin network. Paths are not persistent, nodes come and go, and so the node must continue to discover new nodes as it loses old connections, as well as to assist other nodes when they bootstrap. Only one connection is needed to bootstrap because the first node can offer introductions to its peer nodes, and those peers can offer further introductions. It's also a waste of network resources to connect to more than a handful of nodes. Um, so you don't need to know about all five to 10,000 nodes in the Bitcoin uh, network. You just need to know about a few nearby nodes. After bootstrapping, a node will remember its most successful peer connections so that if it is rebooted, it can quickly reestablish connections with its former peer network. If none of the former peers respond to its connection request, it can use the seed nodes to bootstrap again. If there is no traffic on a connection, nodes will periodically send a message to maintain the connection. If a node has not communicated on a connection for more than 90 minutes, uh, it will assume to be disconnected and a new peer will be sought. Thus, the, the network dynamically adjusts to transient nodes and network problems and can organically grow and shrink as needed without central control. Full nodes are nodes that maintain a full blockchain with all transactions. More accurately, they probably should be called full blockchain nodes. In the early years of Bitcoin, all nodes were full nodes, and currently the Bitcoin core client is a full blockchain node. Um, in recent years, however, new forms of Bitcoin clients have been introduced that don't maintain a full blockchain, but run as lightweight clients, uh, which we'll talk about in the SPV section. Full blockchain nodes maintain a complete and up-to-date copy of the Bitcoin blockchain of all the transactions, which they independently build and verify, starting with the very first block, the Genesis block, and building up to the latest known block in the network. A full blockchain node can independently and authoritatively verify any transaction without recourse or reliance on any other node or source of information. The full blockchain node relies on the network to receive updates about new blocks of transactions, which it then verifies and incorporates into its local copy of the blockchain. Um, there are several implementations of full Bitcoin clients, the most common of which is known as Bitcoin Core, also sometimes referred to as the Satoshi client, which is the reference implementation of Bitcoin. Um, now, running a full node does require more than 400 gigabytes of disk space. Uh, you'll, so you'll need a lot of disk um, and potentially days or weeks to sync your node uh, with the network and download all the blocks in the blockchain. But one of the advantages of running a full node is it gives you the pure Bitcoin experience independent verification of all transactions without the need to rely on uh, or trust any other systems. It's easy to tell if you're running a full node 
because it'll require all that disk space and you'll see it constantly updating to receive new blocks of transactions, which it then verifies and incorporates into its local copy of the blockchain uh, independently and authoritatively. So the first thing a full node will do once it connects to peers is try to construct a complete uh, blockchain, <coughs> which we'll refer to as exchange and inventory. If it's a brand new node and has no blockchain at all, it only knows one block, the Genesis block, which is hard coded into the software. Starting with block zero, the Genesis block, the new node will have to download hundreds of thousands of blocks to synchronize with the network and reestablish the full blockchain. The process of syncing the blockchain starts with the version message uh, because that contains best height, a node's current blockchain height, number of blocks. A node will see the version message from its peers, know how many blocks they each have, and be able to compare to how many blocks it has uh, in its own blockchain. Peer nodes will exchange a get blocks message that contains the hash or fingerprint of the top block on their local blockchain. One of the peers will be able to identify the received hash as belonging to a block that is not at the top, but rather belongs to an older block, thus deducing that its own local blockchain is longer than its peers. The peer that has a longer blockchain has more blocks than the other node and can identify which blocks the other no block node needs in order to catch up. So it's the node is going to identify the first 500 blocks to share and transmit their hashes using an inventory message. The node that's missing these blocks will then retrieve them by issuing a series of get data messages to uh, requesting the full block data and identifying the requested blocks using the hashes from the inventory message. So here, for example, node A and node B exchange get blocks messages. So then um, node B now knows that it's missing, um, that node A is missing um, a bunch of blocks. So it will identify 500 blocks to share and send an inventory message to node A. Because node B has a longer blockchain, it knows that node A is missing these things. So it sends them the 500 hashes. Now, uh, node A will then send a get death data message to retrieve those blocks. And now node B will send the blocks over. Now, the node will keep track. Um, now, what, well, first off, you know, I mentioned that there's hundreds of thousands of blocks in the blockchain, over 700,000. So why only 500 blocks? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the first reason is we don't want to overwhelm, overwhelm a node with a lot of data. So we're going to take data in small chunks. We'll bring over 500 at a time. That's the first reason. The second reason is that, again, this is a peer-to-peer -peer network involving multiple nodes. So even though my diagram shows node A and node B, there may be other nodes involved. And so um, although node A may be getting um, 500 blocks from node B, it might be getting a different 500 blocks from node C and node D and so on. And so we don't want to confuse and, and overlap how, where all the data is coming from. Um, and so that's the other reason why we do this inventory get data part uh, is node B is suggesting the inventory, but node A decides which blocks exactly I'm going to get from node B and potentially I'm getting other blocks from other nodes. And there, there's even a, a defined limit on how many blocks you can get for a particular peer. Um, and so we can make sure that we're not overwhelming any particular peer with this update process. This process of comparing the local blockchain with the peers and retrieving missing blocks happens anytime a node goes offline for any particular period of time. Whether the node's been offline for a few minutes and is missing a few blocks or a month and is missing thousands of blocks, it will follow the same process to download missing blocks. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if, if you're starting off from the Genesis block with a brand new node, I mean, this could take you days or weeks to update your blockchain node to have all the blocks in the network. 
All right, let's talk about simplified payment verification or SPV nodes. Not all nodes have the ability to store the full blockchain. Many Bitcoin clients are designed to run on space and power constrained devices, such as smartphones, tablets, or embedded systems. For such devices, a simplified payment verification SPV method is used to allow them to operate without storing the full blockchain. These types of clients are called SPV clients or lightweight clients. As Bitcoin adoption increases, the SPV node is becoming the most common form of Bitcoin no node, especially for Bitcoin wallets. SPV nodes download only the block headers and don't download the transactions included in each block. The resulting chain of blocks without transactions is a thousand times smaller than the full blockchain. You know, if you need 400 gigabytes to store the full Bitcoin blockchain, you can get away with 400 megabytes to store uh, the SPV block headers. SPV nodes can't construct a full picture of all the UTXOs that are available for spending because they don't know about all the transactions in the network. So SPV nodes verify transactions using a slightly different method that relies on peers to provide partial views of relevant parts of the blockchain on demand. Um, as an analogy, a full node is like a tourist in a strange city that has a detailed map of every street and every address. By comparison, an SPV node is like a tourist in a strange city asking random strangers for directions while knowing only one main road. Uh, although both tourists can verify the existence of a street by visiting it, the tourist without a map doesn't know what lies down any of the side streets and doesn't know what other streets exist. You know, uh, if you're in front of 23 Church Street, the tourist without a map can't tell if there are a dozen other 23 street Church Street addresses in the city and whether this is the right one. So the tourist without a map's best chance is to ask enough people and hope that, you know, they get the directions they need. So SPV verifies transactions by reference to their depth in the blockchain instead of their height, whereas a full blockchain node will construct a fully verified chain of thousands of blocks and transactions reaching down the blockchain back in time all the way back to the genesis block an spv node will verify the chain of all blocks but not all transactions and link that chain to the transaction of interest for example when examining a transaction in block 300,000, a full node links all 300,000 blocks back to the genesis block and builds a full database of utxos establishing the validity of the transaction by confirming the UTXO hasn't been spent yet. An SPV node, however, can't validate whether the transaction has been, the UTXO hasn't been spent yet. Instead, the SPV node will establish a link between the transaction and the block that contains it using a Merkle path. Uh, then the SPV node will wait till it sees six blocks, 300,001 through 300,006, piled on top of the block containing the transaction and verifies it by establishing its depth under uh, block, block 300,006. The fact that other nodes in the network accepted block 300,000 and then did the necessary work to produce six more blocks on top of it is proof by proxy that the transaction in block 300,000 was not a double spend. An SPV node cannot be persuaded that a transaction exists in a block if a transaction does not in fact exist. The SPV node establishes the existence of a transaction in a block by requesting a Merkle path proof and by validating the proof of work in the chain of blocks. However, a transaction's existence can be hidden from an SPV node. An SPV node can prove that a transaction exists but can't verify a transaction uh, such as a double spend of the same UTXO doesn't exist because uh, the SPV node doesn't have a record of all the transactions. This vulnerability could be used in a denial of service attack or double spending attack against SPV nodes. To defend against this, SPV nodes need to connect randomly to several nodes to increase the probability that there's contact with at least one honest node. The need to randomly connect means that SPV nodes also are vulnerable to network partitioning attacks or SIBL attacks uh, where an attacker attempts to connect them to fake nodes or fake networks and uh, prevent the SPV node from having access to honest nodes of the real Bitcoin network. For most practical purposes, 
well-connected SPV nodes are secure enough, striking a balance between resource needs, practicality, and security. But for perfect security, nothing beats running a full blockchain node. Because a full blockchain node verifies a transaction by checking the entire chain of hundreds of thousands of blocks below it in order to guarantee that the UTXO isn't spent, whereas an SPV node just checks how deep the block is buried by a handful of blocks above it. To get the block headers, SPV nodes use a get headers message instead of get blocks that we saw earlier with the full nodes. The responding peer will send up to 2,000 block headers using a single set headers, headers message. The process is otherwise similar to that used by a full node to retrieve full blocks. SPV nodes also set a filter in the connection to peers to filter the stream of future blocks and transactions sent by the peers. Any transactions of interest are retrieved using a get data request. The peer generates a transaction message containing the transactions in response. Because SPV nodes need to retrieve specific transactions in order to selectively verify them, there's also the potential privacy risk. Unlike full blockchain nodes, which collect all the transactions transactions within each block, the SPV nodes request for specific data can be inadvertently uh, can inadvertently reveal the addresses in their wallet. For example, a third party monitoring a network could keep track of the transactions requested by a wallet and use those to associate Bitcoin addresses with a user of that wallet and therefore uh, reduce the privacy that someone has on the Bitcoin blockchain. So um, so how do we deal with this vulnerability that um, you've got this privacy issue where if someone's monitoring these Git headers, they can figure out, you know, and if someone's monitoring how you're proving the transaction exists, how, you know, what can we do to protect the privacy of the users of Bitcoin? Well, um, SPV has this uh, tech has included a technology called Bloom filters to help protect privacy. A Bloom filter is a probabilistic search filter that offers an efficient way to express a search pattern while protecting privacy. These are used by SPV nodes to ask their peers for transactions matching a particular pattern without revealing exactly which address keys or transactions they're looking for. So going back to my earlier analogy of the Taurus without a map asking for directions to a specific address, 23 Church Street. Um, so, in, you know, if I ask strangers for directions that street, I reveal to the strangers that I'm interested in that address. So, for example, you know, if I'm using an automated mapping software, if I type in 23 Church Street into my mapping software, then the provider of the mapping software knows that I'm interested in 23 Church Street. So instead, what I could do is ask a more general question. You know, are there any streets in the neighborhood whose name ends in RCH? Or um, how many church streets are there in uh, the neighborhood? Um, you know, because again, if I just ask a general question about church street, that does not reveal I'm interested in 23 on that street. So using this technique, um, a Taurus could specify a desired address in more detail without explicitly identifying exact the specific address they're looking for. And by varying the precision of the search, the Taurus reveal, reveals more or less information at the expense of, get, of getting more or less specific results. If you have a less specific pattern, you'll get a lot more possible addresses and better privacy, but you also have some irrelevant results. If you ask for a very specific pattern, you get fewer results, but you lose more privacy. So Bloom filters serve this function by allowing an SPV node to specify a search pattern for transactions that can be tuned towards precision or privacy. A more specific Bloom filter will provide accurate results, but at the expense of revealing what patterns the SPV node is interested in, thus revealing the addresses owned by the user's wallet. A less specific Bloom filter will reduce more data about more transactions, many are relevant to the node, 
but allow the node to maintain better privacy. So let's take a look at how Bloom filters work. Bloom filters are implemented as a variable size array of n binary digits, which is a bit field, uh, and a variable number of m hash functions. The hash functions are designed to always produce an output that is between 1 and n, corresponding to the array of binary digits. The hash functions are generated deterministically, so any node implementing a Bloom filter will always use the same hash functions and get the same results for a specific input. By choosing different length uh, Bloom filters and a different number of hash functions, the Bloom filter can be tuned varying the level of accuracy and privacy. So here is a diagram that's gonna, uh, of a simplistic Bloom filter with a 16-bit field in this little table here and three hash functions, K1, K2, and K3. So the Bloom filter is initialized so that the array of all these bits uh, starts off as zero. Um, to add a pattern to the Bloom filter, the pattern is gonna be hashed by each hash function, K1, K2, and K3 in turn. So applying the first hash function to the input results in a number between one and n. The corresponding bit in the array, you know, between one and 16, will then be found and set to one, thereby recording the output of the hash function. Then the next hash function is used to set another bit and so on. Once all the hash functions have been applied, the search pattern will be recorded in the Bloom filter as the bits that have been changed from zero to one. So adding the second pattern is as simple as repeating the process. The pattern is hashed by each hash function in turn, and the result is recorded by setting the bits to one. Note that as a built bloom filter is filled with more patterns, a hash function might coincide with a bit that's already set to one, in which case the bit's not changed. In essence, as more patterns record in overlapping bits, the bloom filter starts to become saturated with more bits set to one, and the accuracy of the filter decreases. This is why the filter is a probabilistic data structure. It gets less accurate as more patterns are added. The accuracy depends on the number of patterns added versus the size of the array and the number of hash functions. A larger array and more hash functions can record more patterns with higher accuracy. A smaller array or, or fewer hash functions will record fewer patterns and produce less accuracy. So here we show the pattern A being added to our simple Bloom filter. So we've got these three hash functions. Um, we pass in pattern A and the output for the first hash function is three. Output for the second hash function is one. Output for the third hash function is 14. So we've got one, three, and 14 that have now been set to one. So now we want to add a second pattern to the Bloom filter. Now we're bringing in B. Now we still have one, three, and 14 set from previously. And now we're going to add B and overlay it. So B uh, has K1 becomes 16, K2 becomes one, K3 becomes seven. So seven and 16 are brand new. One we had set before, but we're setting it again. And so again, we don't change it. We just leave it as one. And so now you have five of these cells have been set to one. Now to test if a pattern is part of a Bloom filter, because um, you know first we set the Bloom filter with these patterns. Now we check to see if a pattern's actually in there. You know, in our in our so for example, um, what we're going to do is we'll hash. Uh, you know, we've we've got our our pattern that we're going to check for. So we hash that pattern by each hash function, and we compare that against our outputs. If all the bits that are indexed by the hash function are set to one, and the pattern is probably in the Bloom filter, uh, but it's probabilistic, it's not a guarantee. So we don't get yes or no. Instead, we get uh, maybe yes or no. So here we're going to test a pattern, and we uh, when we include check this pattern. So let's say this is pattern C, and we're hashing it. We get sixteen one seven. We've got a one. We've got a uh, sixteen. We got a seven. So the pattern is probably a match. We don't know for sure, but it's probably in there. Um, here's an example. Um, this time when we take uh, pattern D and we hash, we get sixteen two seven. Um, and 16 and 7 are in there, but 2 is not because we've got a 0 there. So we know this pattern is definitely not uh, in this bloom, bloom filter.
So how do SPV nodes use Bloom filters? Uh, Bloom filters are used to filter the transactions and blocks containing them, them so that an SPV node receives from its peers, selecting only transactions of interest to the SPV nodes without revealing which addresses or keys it's interested in. So an SPV node will initialize a Bloom filter as empty. In that state, the Bloom filter won't match any patterns, you know, similar to how we started off with all 16 cells at a zero. Uh, then what we're going to do is we'll make a list of all the addresses, keys, and hashes that we're interested in. So we'll extract the public key hash and script hash and transaction IDs from UTXOs controlled by the wallet. We'll then add those to the Bloom filter so the Bloom filter will match if those patterns are present in a transaction without revealing the patterns themselves. We'll then send a filter load message to the peer containing the Bloom filter to use on the connection. On the peer, um, the Bloom filters are checked against each incoming connection. Uh, each incoming transaction. The full node checks several parts of the transaction against the Bloom filter looking for a match, including uh, the four items we see here, here, the transaction ID, the data components from the locking scripts of each of the transaction outputs, which would be every key and hash in the script, each of the transaction inputs, and each of the input signature data components or witness scripts. By checking against these components, Bloom filters can be used to match public key hashes scripts, op return values, public keys and signatures, or compo other components of smart contracts or complicated scripts. After a filter is established, the pair will then test each transaction's output against the Bloom filter. Only transactions that match the filter are sent to the node. In response to a get data message from the node, the peers will send a Merkle block message that contains only block headers for blocks matching the filter and a Merkle path for each matching transaction. The peer will then send transaction messages containing the transactions matched by the filter. As the full node send sends the transactions to the SPV node, the SPV node will discard false positives and use the correctly matched transactions to update its UTXO set and wallet balance. As it updates its own view of the UTXO set, it'll also modify the Bloom filters to match any future transactions, referencing the new UTXOs it just found. Full node then uses the new Bloom filters to match new transactions and the whole process repeats. The node setting the Bloom filters can interactively add patterns to the filter uh, by sending messages to clear the Bloom filter the node can send uh, a clear message. Uh, because it's not possible to remove a pattern from a Bloom filter, a node has to clear and resend a new Bloom filter if a pattern is no longer desired. And the network protocol and Bloom filter mechanism for SPV nodes was defined in Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 37 on peer services. Um, now, something to keep in mind is nodes that implement implement SPV have weaker privacy than a full node, even with these Bloom filters. You know, a full node has all the transactions and therefore doesn't reveal information about whether it has some address in its wallet. Um, an SPV node just has this filtered list of transactions related to addresses, and therefore that filter still does reduce the privacy of the owner. Um, Bloom filters do work pretty well as reducing the loss of privacy. Uh, but even with Bloom filters and adversary monitoring the traffic of an SPV client or connected to it directly as a node in the P2P network can collect information over time to learn the addresses in the wallet of the SPV client. Let's talk about encrypted and authenticated connections. Uh, most new users of Bitcoin assume that the network communications of the Bitcoin node are encrypted. In fact, the original implementation of Bitcoin communicates entirely in the clear. While this is not a privacy concern for full nodes, it's a big problem for SPV nodes. As a way to increase the privacy and security of the Bitcoin P2P network, there are two solutions to provide encryption of the communications. Uh, there's Tor Transport and P2P authentication and encryption with BIP 150 slash 151. So let's talk about Tor, which stands for the Onion Routing Network. Um, that's a software project and network that offers encryption and encapsulation of data through randomized network paths that offer anonymity, untraceability, and privacy. Uh, Bitcoin Core offers several configuration options that allows you to run a Bitcoin node with its traffic transported over the Tor network. 
In addition, Bitcoin Core can also offer a Tor service, allowing other Tor nodes to connect to your node directly over Tor. So Bitcoin Core nodes will offer a hidden Tor service if it's able to connect to a local Tor service. So if you have Tor installed, and the Bitcoin Core process runs as a user with permissions to access the Tor authentication, it should work automatically. Let's talk about peer-to-peer -peer authentication and encryption. Two Bitcoin improvement proposals, BIP 150 and 151, add support for P2P authentication and encryption in the Bitcoin network. These two BIPs define optional services that can be offered by compatible Bitcoin nodes. Uh, BIP 151 enables a negotiated encryption for communications between nodes that support BIP 151. BIP 150 offers optional authentication for peers that allows nodes to authenticate each other's identity using the elliptic curve digital signing algorithm and private keys. BIP 150 requires that prior to authentication, the two nodes have established encrypted communications uh, according to BIP 151. Uh, BIP 150 and 151 are not implemented in Bitcoin Core as of um, early 2021. However, the two proposals have been implemented uh, by Bcoin. BIP 150 and BIP 151 allow users to run SPV clients that connect to a trusted full node using encryption authentication to protect the privacy of the SPV client. Additionally, authentication can be used to create networks of trusted Bitcoin nodes and prevent man in the middle attacks. Finally, P2P encryption, if deployed broadly, would strengthen the resistance of Bitcoin to traffic analysis and privacy eroding surveillance, especially in countries where the internet use is heavily controlled and monitored. And the two standards are BIP 150, peer authentication, and BIP 151, peer-to-peer -peer communication encryption. Let's talk about transaction pools. Almost every node in the Bitcoin network maintains a temporary list of unconfirmed transactions called the memory pool, mempool, or transaction pool. Nodes use this pool to keep track of transactions that are known to the network but are not yet included in the blockchain. For example, a wallet node will use the transaction pool to track incoming payments to the user's wallet that have been received in the network but are not yet confirmed. As transactions are received and verified, they are added to the transaction pool and related to the neighboring nodes to propagate on the network. Some node implementations also maintain a separate pool of off orphan transactions. That if a transaction's input refers to a transaction that is not yet known, such as a missing parent, the orphan transaction will be stored temporarily in the orphan pool until the parent transaction arrives. If a transaction, when a transaction is added to the transaction pool, the orphan pool will be checked for any orphans that reference this transaction's outputs. You know, for example, it's children. Any matching orphans are then validated. If valid, they're removed from the orphan pool and added to the transaction pool, completing the chain that started with the parent transaction. In light of the newly added transaction, which is no longer an orphan, the process is repeated recursively looking for any further descendants until no more descendants are found. Through this process, the arrival of parent transaction triggers a cascade reconstruction of an entire chain of independent transactions by reuniting the orphans with their parents all the way down the chain. Both the transaction pool and orphan pool are stored in local memory and are not saved on uh, persistent storage, rather they're dynamically populated for incoming network messages. When a node starts, both pools are empty and they're gradually populated with new transactions that are received on the network. Some implementations of the Bitcoin client also maintain a UTXO database or pool, which is a set of all spent outputs on the blockchain. Uh, Bitcoin users have a folder of their in their client's data directory, uh, which stores the chain state. Although the name UTXO pool sounds similar to the transaction pool, it represents a different set of data. Unlike the transaction orphan pools, the UTXO pool is not initialized empty, but instead contains millions of entries of unspent transaction outputs, everything that's unspent on the Bitcoin blockchain uh, from all the way back to the Genesis block. The UTXO pool can be stored in local memory or as a database table in persistent storage. 
whereas the transaction orphan pools represent a single node's local perspective and can vary significantly from node to node, depending on when the node was started or restarted, the UTXO pool represents the consensus of the network and therefore sh should vary little between nodes. Furthermore, the transaction orphan pools only contain unconfirmed transactions, while the UTXO pool only contains confirmed outputs. So uh, this lecture I just did is um, licensed under Creative Commons, um, and it includes content from the Mastering Bitcoin GitHub site by Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, I'd like to thank Andreas for making his content available under this license, and the slide deck and these videos are all covered by this license. So thanks again for watching uh, this lecture on the Bitcoin network, part of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett.